Today we've got a crazy story of revenge against a naval officer. We'll get to that in a bit, but first, got revenge? Felt great. Was excited to share my story from when I went to uni in Southampton nearly 20 years ago. So I went to a house party and got there before any of my friends did. I poked my head into the living room and there was a DJ set up and about four people in there. I didn't know anyone so I just gave an awkward nod and went back into the hallway. The DJ goes, who was that jerk over the speakers and I hear everyone laugh. I was going through a rough time at that point and it really cut me. So I proceeded to put drinks close to his decks all night. I was subtle, but I made sure to keep stacking them up. Sure enough, I was talking to a girl in the kitchen when suddenly all the music cut out and a whole party gave out a collective sigh. The DJ freaked out as his decks were ruined. In answer to his question, I'm that jerk. I think this is just a bit of a lesson that you need to think twice before just calling a random stranger a total jerk. Because you never know, that person might be just experiencing the worst day they've ever experienced. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy awesome stories of revenge, why not hit that subscribe button down below. That said, our next story is, bad parking equals bad time. There was a jerk that parked sideways across four handicapped spaces, like nobody could park in all four of them. It was a huge lifted truck with huge tires. I used to work on bicycles and had my valve core removal tool in my car. Unscrewed all four of his valve cores and taped them to his windshield. All four tires were now flat and it's unlikely he has that tool on him so he can't air them back up because he can't put the valve cores back in without it. I didn't leave a note because he knew what he did. This was before the days of camera phones or I'd have stayed to get his reaction on video. I parked in an adjacent lot at another store to watch the carnage unfold. First, a cop actually rode by and stopped to put a ticket on his windshield. Then the guy comes out with all his groceries and starts putting them into the truck before it dawns on him that his truck is a few inches shorter. Big rage fit, stomps back inside, probably to have them check their non-existent cameras, comes back out and has another rage fit, calls a tow truck, regular tow truck shows up, has to leave and go get a flatbed tow truck. Sure he charged extra for that. Guy's truck is finally loaded up and he angrily gets in the tow truck and they drive off into the sunset. The funny part is that he didn't appear to notice the ticket on his windshield yet. So I'm sure there was another rage fit when he eventually saw it. A couple people saw me doing it and were like, I saw nothing and kept walking. Still the best piece of petty revenge I've ever dished out. Personally, I would say it's kind of severe for somebody. I mean, I know they did take four parking spots, but but man, you really dumped all over this guy. Hundreds of dollars of costs. This next story is Ultimate Dixie Cup Payback for Annoying Rich Dorm Mate. This was many years ago when I was in college. We had mostly amazing people on our dorm, first floor, except for Charles, who was very rich. He flaunted his wealth by pointing out his watch, computer, and other items by saying how expensive they are and hope no one would steal them. All the rooms in our dorm had vinyl flooring. This was not acceptable to him, so he had his dad have some carpet guys come over during Thanksgiving break and put a wall-to-wall carpet down. In December, the floor got cold and you wouldn't want to walk on it barefoot, so we all had slippers and flip-flops we used to walk around the dorm. He would keep pointing out how nice it was to walk barefoot in his room, and he wished he could get the hallway carpeted for the hallways. Cue the petty revenge! When Christmas break arrived, we asked our floor preceptor to leave Charles' room unlocked before leaving for Christmas break. The preceptor also hated this kid since we would complain about all kinds of things. All she said was not to steal anything or do anything that would have campus police investigate. Since a couple of my high school friends lived nearby the college, We snuck into the dorm, no one was there on New Year's Day. We bought a huge case of small coated Dixie cups, a stapler, huge box of staples, and two water jugs. We started in the corner farthest away from the door and would lay down Dixie cups and staple them together. Then we would fill them with water and work our way out to the door and leave enough room for the door to open. We got back to the dorm early once school started and told everyone that someone was playing a joke on Charles. And then we all waited in the common area till Charles came in and opened his door. The look on his face was worth all the trouble and money we spent on this. There was no way for him to remove the water since if he tried to pick up a cup, 
it would pull the other cups and water would ruin his precious carpet. Charles was fuming and yelling and said he was going to go to the dean. We pointed out that that would not be a good idea since the carpet was illegal and he would get in trouble for modifying the room, which was strictly forbidden. When he realized that he was screwed, he had to walk over the cups to make a call to his dad since none of us would allow him to use our phone. Only landline in those days. I'm sure the cleanup crew got paid a lot of money to clean up and restore the room. We became famous on campus after this, and Charles left the school at the end of the semester. Revenge is best served in a Dixie cup full of water. Now, I definitely know that it would make the carpet pretty darn wet, but like, I guess a hairdryer would probably be too noisy for too long a period of time in a dorm, right? I'm just trying to think like, it wouldn't be the end all be all of a bunch of water got on the carpet if they had some way to just dry it relatively alright. This next story is horrible roommate with insane boyfriend who won't leave? Bye! Managed to find an awesome house to rent after college with two other friends. One was my good buddy from undergrad, let's call him Ben. The other was someone who I'd gotten to know through another close friend, and let's call her Crystal. Everything's all fine, and actually great for quite some time. Lived our own lives, but had a great time hanging out together too. The perfect roommate situation. That is, until Crystal started dating Pablo. Pablo was the ultimate deadbeat with a Napoleon complex. Just a little over a month into our lease, Pablo got evicted from his place, and Crystal asked if he could stay for a short period while he looked for a new place. Being understanding and empathetic, and trusting Crystal, we had no reason not to. We said sure as long as it's temporary. Big mistake. Pablo lost his job. Pablo had been dishonorably discharged from the military. Pablo was an unsuccessful gambler. Pablo was a drunk. It was New Orleans, so it's not like any of us had a leg to stand on here. But he was a dangerous drunk. He would verbally abuse Crystal, waking up the whole household in the middle of the night with fights. He killed her pet fish by running it under scalding hot water. He would hurl racial slurs at my then boyfriend. He broke Ben's Wii. On numerous occasions, he left the front door wide open. Anyone who knows New Orleans knows this is a bad move, even in the safest areas. He left an empty pot on the stove with the burner on, and I came home to a house full of smoke. He was really putting everyone's lives in danger. Ben and I decided to have a house meeting to discuss our concerns with her, and knowing that sometimes emotions can flare, we came with a written agenda so as to just stick to the facts. Yet Crystal defended him, and offered no solution to when he would be leaving and finding his own place. Spoiler, he never would. Really rubbing salt in the wound, Pablo had gambled much of their money, and Crystal was having trouble making rent one month. She asked if she could borrow it and pay me back next paycheck. Again, being a trusting empath and feeling like we had no other choice, I did. I was furious to find out that the two of them had left for a long weekend at a casino resort in Mississippi before having paid me back. Well, now for the petty revenge. I'd been working two full-time jobs, I saved like crazy, and it was 2008 and housing prices had dipped. I decided to buy my own home. Ben knew all about this, so did my landlady, and was planning to be my roommate in the new house. But I never mentioned a single word to Crystal. I found a great place, made an offer, and closed a little thereafter. It just so happened that the day I closed on the house, when we were already planning to move and just get the heck out of Dodge, Crystal and Pablo took one of their famous casino getaways. We got around 15 to 20 of our close friends, one of whom had an enormous truck and a giant flatbed. Of course, someone did. It was Louisiana. Many hands make light work. And within a few short hours, the entire house other than their room was cleared out. Oh, did I mention? All the furniture, all the kitchen stuff, everything in the common rooms belonged to either me or Ben. Crystal and Pablo returned home at the end of a full day of gambling, only to find a completely empty house, except for their room. We told them that we had switched the utilities that were under my name to a new house, and we had informed the landlady and paid out our share of the remainder of the lease. The looks on their faces was priceless. We left and never saw them again. Hallelujah. This guy was relentlessly unhinged. The fish story alone is enough to tell that. 
I would not go anywhere near this guy after finding out that they did that. Our next story is The Impossible Conservatory. I once answered the phone to a telemarketer looking to sell me a conservatory. Now, normally I haven't gotten time for this sort of thing, and I'll politely say no thank you or simply hang up. However, on this occasion, it was a Friday afternoon in work and things were quiet, so I decided to waste the gentleman's time like he's done to so many with his cold calling. Now, I should say, I know nothing about conservatories apart from they were attached to houses, so I used this call to try and learn as much as I could, asking what they were made from, what options I could get in terms of roof, bricks, glass. I then told the gentleman that I was interested in getting a price for a conservatory, so he asked what I'd be looking for, to which I just regurgitated most of the information to him and he was lapping it up. The final thing to do was to get someone out to come and measure up to give me an accurate quote. I gave my name and email address, which was all good, and then I gave him my address. On the 11th floor of a block of flats. Well, the conversation changed very quickly. The gentleman was clearly annoyed, but as pointed out, I knew nothing about conservatories when he called me. He got so angry he put the phone down. This killed some time on a slow Friday and gave me a feeling of victory against cold callers. I mean, if you're working a job that honestly does have some downtime, a telemarketer that you can kind of tool around with and have fun with, honestly, you know, once in a while doesn't sound bad if you're used to just having nothing to do during this downtime. This next story is, the teacher's pet gets to cheat? Okay, I'll help. Here's my petty revenge story from the 80s. My parents moved pretty often around a very small part of a midwestern state, so I went to many tiny schools that varied wildly in how well they taught their students. In between my freshman and sophomore year, we moved to the largest town in our area. I went from being in a freshman class of just 25 students to a class of 300 students. It was a huge culture shock for me. None of the schools I'd attended had any kind of drama club or classes. I had no frame of reference for any kind of theater type stuff, or many things that happened in the much larger school system really. So my English teacher was the drama class slash club queen. Drama is her life. She works with local colleges to produce plays and stages yearly plays at the high school. She does community theater with all the local students, and she has favorites. She's not shy about who she likes and who she hates. She would always fix the schedules so her favorite drama kids got her English class because she was so integral to their lives and crucial to their development, which I thought was extra weird. Drama club seemed a little culty. Also, sometimes she would expose a kid who had messed up in a play during class. She was a mean bully who played favorites. I did very well in my English classes with her and was even bored somewhat by the curriculum. By about mid-year, this drama teacher pulled me aside and said I should have been in a tougher class. She said there were no spots in the high track class, but that she would sit me in front of her desk. She would then teach me a little extra on the side so I wouldn't miss out. She said she would make sure I got into high track my junior year. I was pretty excited to be singled out in such a huge class. I was also excited at the idea of high track for my next year. I really enjoyed English classes generally. Well, the extra work was totally bogus. She handed me the Scarlet Pimpernel and told me to write a report. The book was boring and I wasn't getting extra credit for it. I didn't much like her as a teacher. I quit reading the extra work that was only for me to do in this class and just pretended like I hadn't agreed to it. She also quit talking about extra work, but she kept me front and center at her desk. I realized that next to me was her favorite student, the star of our little drama club. Let's call him Nick. She'd been coaching Nick on drama since middle school, and she would often tell us Nick would one day win an Oscar. Nick would always reply that he would thank her in his acceptance speech from the podium. She would smile and pat him and praise him. They had little secret jokes between themselves they would make mid-class. It was really weird. So I come back from Christmas break, and we're taking our first big test for the semester when it happens. Nick casually leaned towards me and said sotto voce, Hey, what's the answer to question 8? He's not speaking in a normal tone of voice, but he's not whispering. I'm sitting right in front of the teacher's desk. I could have reached out and touched it with a foot. I looked at Nick, and then I looked at the drama teacher. I waited and waited. She sat there as if she hadn't heard a thing. 
None of the students near us said anything either. Totally surreal. If I got caught cheating, I knew my mother would tear me up. But did it count as cheating if I just told this guy the answer? So I dusted off the Gen X motto and said, whatever. I gave him the answer and waited for her to send us to the office or something. She just sat there so pleased with herself. I kept waiting for her to say something and as the semester went on, Nick kept asking for the answers to more and more questions on the tests. Now I'm reviewing what has happened in this class and I'm realizing she figured out that I was good in this class and got me next to her future Oscar winner explicitly to help him cheat. As the semester goes on, I studied harder and went with the flow, but I was pretty mad. She straight up used me because I was the new kid. I had a plan. A modest proposal, if you will. I started whispering the harder stuff to Nick so he wouldn't have to ask so much and would even angle my paper so he could see it better. All semester long. I wanted him to not worry about a single answer on any test. I wanted his cheating experience to be smooth as silk. And she was thrilled that I figured out what she wanted. Then it was finals time. Even though we were just high school students, we were in a university town, so it was modeled on the university style. The final had a huge weight on our overall grade. I gave him entirely wrong answers. Absurdly wrong answers, in fact. I guess he had long ago stopped doing anything with the class material because he just wrote down everything I said. She was a good actor because she must have been screaming inside listening to me. She never flinched or even raised her eyes at me. She never indicated she knew what was happening. I enjoyed it so much. It felt so, so great. The most fun I ever had taking a test. When the bell rang, she looked up and looked right at me. I just smiled and smiled right back at her. The aftermath, I've always wondered what she did about his test. There's simply no way she flunked him. I'm positive he failed that test badly. She got me back though. I was never allowed an AP English or high track English my entire high school career. I was pissed, but it was worth it. Nick ended up going to New York because of the stage called to him. He got on a few shows, but ended up nowhere. The best part though? There was someone in that class who did make it pretty big in Hollywood. It wasn't Nick and it wasn't me, just a quiet kid who sat in the back of the class the whole time. I don't think I ever spoke to him the whole time we were in school together. This kid was very introverted and not someone who you'd think Hollywood. But every time I see this person getting Hollywood accolades, I toast to Nick. Future Oscar winner and the drama teacher who nearly coached someone who made it. That must have really burned her up. I don't know if this school is just way bigger than anything I'd been to or experienced, but it's kind of crazy to me that this teacher would put so much stock in a kid like that that they're willing to just blatantly allow them to cheat. I guess I didn't really go to a high school that had programs that would produce, you know, these prodigies of whatever field they're in, whether it's sports or whether it's the finer arts. This next story is Vigilante Parking Lot Justice. Some context. One, last week the driver's side passenger area of my van got sideswiped and the guy did a hit and run. It still runs but my kid's door is collapsed in and we haven't been able to afford to get it fixed just yet. It looks pretty bad but looks worse than it is. Two, people who leave shopping carts and parking spaces are a personal pet peeve of mine. So I'm sick, cold, not COVID, and I go to my local Walgreens for some heavy Dayquil and Tylenol for my kids. I walk out and this woman my mom's age, I'm 39, takes her shopping cart and very deliberately parks it in the painted over section between the only two handicapped spaces in the lot. Like the part that's supposed to be left clear so people can get out. It's literally 15 steps to the door of the Walgreens. I reflexively call out, in the handicapped space? Really? She goes, yeah, I know. And usually at this point, because I'm the one to always tell people the door is right there, people get embarrassed and walk their car to the door. Not this woman. She launches into a whole soliloquy about how she thought about the placement because it's close to the door, so the single person working inside can grab it easily. And she put it there on the passenger side so people can still pull in and they won't have anyone with them anyway. What the freak? People with placards are loners now? And anyway, she gets it because her husband has had several bypasses, so she understands how these things work. 
By the way, all this took her at least twice as long to say as it would have taken for her to walk the darn car to the door. I say, well, glad you got that all justified for yourself. Her walking to her car. I don't need to be justified. I'm in love. No idea what this woman's talking about. Me getting into my car, which happens to be parked across from the aisle from her. I said, no, I meant your rudeness. She literally laughs as she climbs in her car. So I back up and angle my car like I'm pulling out of the parking lot, but instead stop right in front of her hood. The banged inside of my car is in full view. Go ahead, lady. Does it look like I care if my car gets hit? She goes nuts inside her car, yelling and leaning on the horn. I just turn off my engine and visibly pull out a book. The cart got put back. For anybody who's had an experience where people are either misparked in the handicap space who didn't belong there, or saw that somebody left a cart for them in that handicap space that they needed, thank you for standing up for them. Our next story is, naval officer didn't want to live with enlisted, gets fired. So this happened about a year and a half ago, but I recently heard the news on how far my revenge went. I was a Navy enlisted service member and was stationed in Yokosuka, Japan for a few years before I got transferred back stateside. I worked in the main hospital that cared for service members and their beneficiaries. It's a small hospital so everyone knows everyone. Shortly after I left, I caught wind of a new physician officer working in the radiology department. My friends would say he's horrible to work with but that's nothing new. However, someone saw him print a letter and he left it on his desk and took a picture of it and sent it to me. He's requesting to move from enlisted housing to officer. Edit, I found out it's not a private letter. He did actually send it to housing and most of housing is ran by enlisted members. For context, military housing is available for those who are married, have a family, or are qualified based on their rank and depending on the military base itself. Typically, officer housing is much nicer than the enlisted. In Yokosuka, housing is basically the same all around because it's overseas. But most of the housing are apartments, and each apartment complex is called a tower. Example, Fuji Tower. There are nine towers and two are for officers, since enlisted members outnumber officers by a lot. Now, one thing about the military, crap happens. When getting stationed, it's the active duty member's responsibility to either apply for housing on or off base before arriving, depending on what's allowed. If there's limited space and you don't apply for housing on time, then you get put where there is space. So our new officer got placed in an enlisted tower. Mind you, enlisted members have families of their own and other officers have been placed in enlisted housing before without an issue. Here are some of the quotes in his letter. And yes, this guy has a PhD. I have many valid objections to living in a building of almost all entitled and even many lower enlisted being an officer. There is a lot of crime, violent actions, drug use and alcoholism that happen in enlisted housing. There are also sexual assaults and other perverts. I have a good looking family, a wife and two daughters aged 3 and 4. They are prime targets to be victims for these enlisted deviant activities. My family should be safe in housing that's with officers. Officers are much more respectable, and these types of deviant activities are incredibly rare compared to the deviant activities of enlisted being commonplace. Other officer families will not want to visit us because our family lives in enlisted housing. My children need to make friends with other officer children. My wife needs to make friends with other officers' wives. I need to make friends with other officers. Forcing an officer to live in a large apartment building with almost all enlisted is unethical. You get the idea. So this guy basically looks down on all enlisted service members, assuming every single one are drug users, perverts or predators, criminals, etc. The kicker? He was an enlisted army member before going to officer school. In civilian terms, think of a manager that discriminates and calls all of his subordinates criminals, violent, alcoholics, pervs, drug users, etc. based on your job position, forgetting that some have a family and, you know, maybe aren't any of those things. And he not only has the authority to ruin your work life, he can ruin your personal life, deny days off, make you stay late, ride you up if he doesn't like you and not letting you promote. Safe to say, 
Everyone was pissed and I have nothing to lose. I was separating soon and figured I'd have some fun before I get out. I created a burner Facebook account and posted the letter and the officer's picture on a popular military enlisted group page. Within two days, it spread like wildfire. But I wasn't done yet. The military has something called challenge coins. Think of trading cards but custom coins that come in many sizes and shapes. I designed one with his face and a big middle finger in the back. On top of that, I designed stickers to show how proud us deviants are. Other coin designs came from other people as well, but so far I think mine was more popular. I sold over 70 coins to the initial person who originally sent me the picture at a huge discounted price so she can sell them for a profit for herself. So the officer's face is everywhere because most people keep their coins displayed on their desk. No matter where the officer went at work, he would see his face on someone's desk. And since he didn't have his name on the coin, can't officially say it's him, I sold more stateside and even got some sent to Europe. I made about $3,000 overall which was nice. The story even got featured on the online naval newspaper and on two popular YouTube channels. And if you're military, you know the only time big military cares is when it's too big to sweep under the rug. The story got the officer sent up to the captain's mast which is like navy court. He tried to say his wife was the one that wrote the letter, but no one's buying it because her writing style is way worse. She even tried to take the fall but no one believed her. They both ended up deleting all social media. Due to this, he got served three UCMJ articles which basically are his offenses. But there's more. When you're in the military, you have a deadline on how long you can be a certain rank. If you don't pick up, then you're kicked out. And because he's new and got served UCMJ articles, he won't be up for his promotion and therefore was involuntarily separated. Also, the officer program he went through pays for his PhD. When the military pays for your PhD, you have to serve 10 years to pay them back. If you don't complete 10 years, you have to pay the military back with money instead of time. So he lost his job and now has to pay back the military for his PhD. And since it takes a while for the paperwork to have him and his family sent back stateside, you can bet he socially suffered because no one worked with him. I'm just surprised I learned something new with the military challenge coins. I'm surprised they could have one with just a big middle finger on it. I mean, that's pretty cool. I sure as heck would go and buy one. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another absolutely awesome story of revenge, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.